Thanks again for dropping in, and welcome back to the Rex Reviews Podcast. It's Lou McCoy, Casey Day, and the legendary Tiborosaurus Rex joining you for another installment of our radio extravaganza. Today we're checking out some new technology, some new equipment, and new prospects as we are trying to tie a telephone line into the podcast today. And we're not too sure quite yet how it's going to work, but we're optimistic. Yeah, I tried drilling holes in the last telephone and hooking wires into there to try to get the guests on. It just doesn't work properly. But uh, the webmaster, Casey, here, she figured out this deal where they can actually call into the show. And so we can interview these expert guys now. Rather than me trying to relay secondhand all the high-tech information, we can just talk to the actual experts in the industry. And so we've got some cool guests coming up around the corner on the Rex Reviews podcast. we got lots of folks coming around. And today, I think you'll enjoy our special guest as well. We're going to have a discussion about some optics and different configurations for optics for different applications of fire. We talk a lot about extreme long range precision shooting in our sniper 101 tutorial series and that's a very narrow field of study that's a specialized deal that requires very specific equipment however there's other fields in the even the long range shooting where different optical parameters might be more advantageous for use. Absolutely. And it depends, once again, upon the application. Absolutely. And a lot of times, people try to uh, superimpose the criteria from one craft into another. And in the terms of ultra long range precision shooting, having the turrets real precise and set up exactly so that you can make a long range firing solution by indexing the uh, thing on your turrets is very advantageous. And uh, the reticle design is good for certain applications there. But when you're talking about designated marksmanship applications where you might have to take shots at multiple targets that might be moving under stressful conditions, that's where some of these other ballistic drop compensation device reticles can actually be kind of advantageous in the field. And so we're going to talk to a guy who is kind of on the cutting edge of reticle design. And uh, I think you guys will dig the discussion and we'll just have him on for maybe a couple segments here depending on uh, if we burn them out immediately or not as fast so it's pretty exciting stuff today our first guest ever on the rex reviews podcast is dimitri mccrulis and who better to talk rifle scope reticles than a guy that designs them indeed <laughs> i picture him sitting over there with like some terminator sunglasses on and the leather jacket that's kind of how i'm picturing it right now I've got a very similar mental image at the moment too. So Dimitri, when you send in the picture for the deal, you gotta you gotta make me something awesome, like Terminator Two style, Austin La Vista baby kind of shot. I'm actually disappointed you guys didn't have like a drum roll. There was no like crowd cheering in the back, like no kind of sound effect thing or Well, there is a turtle in the room. It let me see what it's doing. He's so <laughs> right now. So could we uh, start off by maybe asking you just to tell us a little bit about yourself, Mr. Dimitri, and uh, your history and how you got to be in the place where you are today? Sure. I started off with a BB gun. My dad taught me how to shoot on a BB gun. Uh, Killed about every bird in the neighborhood. Law enforcement would show up and take my BB gun once a week. (laughs) Oh, he's already been through one of them deals. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. The, you know, everybody's always trying to take my gun, so I, I, it spawned from there. And, um, you know, grew up shooting twenty two and got into two two three. started ground squirrel hunting, got into, you know, reloading and that kind of thing. And, you know, grew up around some buddies of mine that were in the military and, you know, I, I'm hopping on the Internet, and Sniper's Hide and, you know, your channel and trying to get all the different formulas together and how to range estimate and kind of just information gathering. Um, and that's, you know, kind of the meat and potatoes of it. Uh, I spent a lot of years into martial arts, like mixed martial arts. And I, I attribute some of that to that because it's kind of in taking things that work and throwing out things that don't. And when you apply the same type of thing in reticle design, you actually come out with a, a, a superior reticle than You know, ones that only have one or two attributes, if you combine all the attributes that make reticles uh, superior or or, uh, effective in a a particular thing, then you end up with a pretty good end product. Why did you pick to get into scopes? Um, I I never really saw anything out there that met my needs. And um, 
after following like the uh, international sniper competition and listening to uh, what all the sniper instructors were saying on that and friends of mine that are snipers and sniper instructors, it was very, very eye-opening that the doctrine changed once we hit uh, urban areas like Iraq. Instead of taking a long-range precision-type shot, it turned more into a DMR-type uh, fighting where you're fighting multiple targets that have limited exposure and uh, a very dynamic, different type of uh, uh, battlefield. So it, the, it became very clear that there were gaps that needed to be filled, and that's kind of how some of the things came to be. So like the, the HUD reticle, for instance, that, we, that Rex kind of briefly covered, that kind of solved a lot of the issues that were, were, were faced there to where uh, you know, one moment you're taking a precision shot to the next moment you're having to transition to multiple targets and the uh, spotter sniper dialogue goes out the window. So we found very often the, the spotter ends up holding, a, you know, an M4 with a ACOG or M16 or whatever he, he, he's carrying and having to shoot himself. Well, if he's shooting too, then how is he going to relate any kind of firing solution input to the sniper? Yeah, there's just too much going on on some of those situations to be able to do math. You lose all your trigonometry skills when you're uh, in an exciting situation is kind of how that deal works, I think. Yeah. You can't shoot at them when you're holding a calculator is what happens. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Would you say that your scopes then reflect more of a military-based use? Uh, certain ones. Um, I mean, we have some reticles that are designed specifically for planking, except for a 22, that instead of ranging center mass and that kind of thing, they're, they're ranging a clay pigeon and a bottle and a, a Coke can, that kind of thing. We have other reticles that are designed for extreme long range that can be uh, used for target shooting as well. So... I, I, I like to problem solve, and, and depending on what the application is, I design a reticle for it. Yeah, so maybe let's take a walk through some of your different reticle designs there. I know that you sent me a few of them, and it's interesting. I, I think I was doing a, a review on a Nikon optic, and uh, a lot of folks started asking about primary arm scopes. And uh, believe it or not, I kind of am behind the times when it comes to like the stuff that's coming out nowadays, and there's a lot of new uh, optics coming out and so a lot of the viewers actually requested that i do primary arms and then lo and behold i had the opportunity from a couple different outfits to uh to try some of these out and so um if you want to just kind of take us on a general overview of uh which way you want to start off on maybe your precision rifle scope uh, the six to thirty that's the platinum grade optic yeah uh a friend of mine um recommended I contact you. So he, he might have been one of the people hounding you. Um but yeah on the on the six by thirty uh it comes in two different reticles but the I think the reticle you're talking about is the DECA and um uh, I, I designed that from input from extreme long range precision shooters and their their input basically it, it came down to the finer you can break down your mill hold, the more accurate your because what they're, most of them are doing is they're dialing in their elevation and then they're holding for wind because wind constantly is changing. You're constantly holding on the reticle depending on what the wind is doing at that particular moment. Uh, very often yeah. people will run data of, say, 10-mile-an-hour wind. Well, that was, you know, 30 seconds ago. Now it changed. Yeah, so you dial in your elevation because that's relatively constant for a given shot. And then your wind is continuously changing, so you might dial in your spin, hold off. But then your wind, you know, you kind of got to play that by ear. So absolutely, yep, that's a good design. Exactly. So we figured that if you, you know, th there's been full mill increments and you went to half mill. And then people went to a uh, quarter of a mill, 0.20 of a mill. So what we did is we broke it into 0.20 of a mil increments that are exactly 0.10 of a mil. So the in-between gaps equate to 0.10 as well. So we essentially broke the mil system down into tenths. 
Yeah, so it's kind of a fractional geometry situation where you can subdivide as far as you can discern with your eyeball. And for people who use the reticle for ranging, uh, that's one of the limitations of conventional mill scale reticles, mill dot reticles, is uh, you know the, the reticle is only really going to encourage a certain degree of precision when you're looking at it, just based on the simplicity of the reticle design. And uh, there's some subconscious stuff going on there, but it, it sometimes people might be encouraged by reticle design to make a sloppy mill calculation when they're ranging their target. And so when you're doing your formulas, you got to know the exact size of the target in your reticle so that you have a precise base on your triangle, especially when you're shooting at long range over 800 meters. And uh, it's incredibly important to have some way of getting really precise with your mill readings. And uh, that's been one of the limitations. Honestly, in my experience, I haven't had a lot of luck milling targets consistently effectively beyond maybe a thousand meters uh, i mean even 800 is probably more of an honest uh statement you know without verifying your distance using lasers or gps or aerial photography or something like that maps uh so it's difficult to be able to range your target just purely on mills at long range just because it's such a tiny target out there but with the deck and mill design you can you can get into that fractional geometry where you can subdivide and subdivide if you get to know your reticle and to become kind of intimate with it, uh, it's very, very uh, smart how it was put together. So you should, if especially with the magnification, that's a 30 power magnification and it has pretty decent glass. So you can actually use it at 30 power for doing your, your mill calculations and it's a first focal plane reticle. So when you crank up your power, your mill is still you know, going to be the same size in relation to the target that at any other power range. So you can actually use that reticle and if you zoom in on 30 power, you can get real precise mill readings on your target. So you can make a pretty good range determination. And that should increase your hit probability by a decent margin. So yeah, that DECA uh, mill reticle is something that is cutting edge. I haven't seen a design quite like that before. Correct. It, it took almost a year to put together. And if you notice, we went to a chevron tip instead of uh, crosshairs. Yep. When you look at targets at, you know, further distance through a crosshair, you get this weird... Uh, halo effect i don't even know how to you know what i'm talking about where you yep. it obstructs the target and you get like a fuzzy type well the the chevron tip eliminates that because in theory you have no minute of angle right there it's just uh you're almost lollipopping the shot and the whole reticle across has been designed to be lollipopped and not be obstructed in any way yep you just got a that uh sharp point so you can't really obstruct your uh your exact aiming point. That's a very, very good design. Absolutely. A lot of times, if you're shooting at beer cans beyond a thousand meters, you might have difficulty because your crosshairs actually covers up them small targets. They're prairie dogs at 1,200 meters. I mean, your crosshair is going to, if if you're not holding off for wind or something, it might very well cover up your target and make a, it very difficult to get a precise aiming point. So for extreme long range target shooting or precision shooting, that Chevron designed for your aiming point is a really, really good design. Yeah, I saw your video where you hit that can. That was, <laughs> that's, pretty, that's pretty amazing right there. That was uh, quite a shot. That's that, the secret ingredient to that is no wind, <laughs> and and to to reveal some top secret information on the Rex Reviews uh, podcast here, that is kind of my old stomping grounds. So I have a lot of rounds downrange in that exact valley. So it's not really hard once you've shot like ten thousand rounds in that valley to uh, know kind of what's going to happen. So that was one of the places where I really polished up my skills for a while. And uh, every time I get to visit that part of the country again, I go back out there and I, I always pop off a few. And it's nice. You get the higher altitude mountain environments. You got thin air and you got uh, very little wind uh, in certain areas. And that can be conducive to easy long range shooting. Uh, there's been some incredible shots made in that valley. I can tell you that. It was that beer can shot that made you an Internet sensation, actually, Rex. Yeah, I don't know how that works. That's what made people curious to try to figure out how to do stuff like that, I guess, you know. And it's just incredible, the uh, technology and everything that you see evolving in this field, just in the little bit of time that we've been hanging out, and you've really gotten me into the craft, Rex, designs like this, the non-obstructing reticle, and it just kind of blows my mind that people are out there splitting atoms like this, and 
I don't know if I can ask this, but Dimitri, how exactly does one go about creating a new design for a scope? You got to think so far outside the box that I wouldn't even know where to begin. I think part of it is because I'm a shooter first and then engineer, designer, whatever you want to call it, second. So I face a lot of these problems myself. I have to range estimate things. I have to, uh, you know, shoot at smaller dot, not you know, not the size of a beer can, but I typically shoot at a, a 18 by 30 inch torso size target. And uh, even that, once you start getting past a thousand, looks you know, it's harder to make out. I mean, it's so it, it, it's kind of uh, you know trial and error and, and kind of seeing what what I need to make that job. It's almost like problem solving, I guess, is the best way to describe it. And uh, how I think out of the box and solve the problems, um, I don't know. I guess I credit math to that. I think math is the greatest weapon of them all. And when you do the math, the the design kind of makes itself. So, Wise words there. So if we take a look at the ACSS reticle, that's kind of one that was really intriguing to me. And at first, I got to admit that uh, I didn't understand exactly what was going on. And there's such a huge abundance nowadays of different fancy reticle designs that everyone produces. And me being kind of an old school shooter, I was really sold on the mill dot design because uh, that's kind of what dudes trained me on or whatever when they got me into the long range deal was just using the standard mill dot design and uh a lot of these other bdc reticles because my craft that i was doing there's so many environmental variables that change continuously over the day to where a lot of the bdc designs were not maybe advantageous for my applications because they were rendered maybe uh not exactly perfect for you know shots at 1300 yards or something but for like you're talking about designated marksmanship applications where you're uh shooting at uh, multiple targets at unknown distances in a firefight and you don't have time to screw around with calculators or even looking at a ballistics table these uh certain reticles can be very advantageous and with this particular design after i kind of understood kind of what it was that you were trying to accomplish with the design it actually kind of uh it aged like wine a little bit in my mind because and after i got a chance to use one i've been shooting one for a while now on my 300 blackout and that's a cartridge that's plagued by a lot of drop even at closer ranges so having something like a bdc reticle is very advantageous for a cartridge like that especially with subsonic loads but uh if you want to kind of explain some of the details on the acss reticle uh, we're looking at a picture of one here and um maybe you can kind of walk us through what you got going on with that okay are you looking at the uh, standard one, like that's found in the ACOG version, or are you looking at the 300 blackout? Or right now, I'm looking at the blackout one. Let's start with that one because that's the one that I've been shooting the most. It has the the Chevron aiming point and the dots, and then we can move on to the other designs. Um, you know, it, it's basically uh, bullet drop compensation that we tend to run. Uh, high. And I know I mentioned to you that in, in private when we've talked a couple of times is that the worst thing you can do is overshoot on a target. So if you shoot at 400, but the target is really at 375, you just overshot. Yeah, you shoot over the top. That's a very common miss is over the top. Yep. Correct. So we And then it's very difficult the, to spot your shot too because the bullet will drop down behind the target and you won't even see an impact. <laughs> Cuz you'll see like a dust signature from behind the target and you're not going to know exactly what's going on. It's going to confuse you. I, I watched your video actually where you talk about all the different splashes and all that and I was like I thought to myself, "Oh, that explains a lot." Cuz a lot of times I see splash and I'm like how did I miss by so much? But I did and I hit the steel and it's this frag hitting off to the left or Yeah, something. peripheral yeah. splash. You know, there's a conspiracy theory just to uh, get get out there a little ways that there was actually a shooter on the grassy knoll out there in that beer can shot video that was way back when, because like people don't understand that that's possible to do. I know a lot of guys who shoot better than me, honestly, who do stuff like that all the time. You know, I'm just one of many. But um, yeah, there, there's theories that there's a guy hiding behind a bush out there with a rifle, and then when I shot that guy behind the bush, shot it. Because I don't, I don't know, but no. <laughs> a second shooter. Yeah, yeah, the second shooter behind the grassy bush or whatever. I've, there's a lot of comments, and it. it's pretty cute. But yeah, there's a lot of things like peripheral splash. Uh, there's a lot of debris and things that happen. So um, 
Yeah, when you're talking about in terms of spotting your round, it's hard to tell from when bullet fragments hit a target. When you hit a target, bullet fragments fly off in every direction, especially on steel, 360 degrees. So you got dust kicking up all over the place. You can have ricochets. If you're shooting at a fluid target, like a creature or a beer can or whatever, you got supersonic jetting of gas that happens. And a lot of that is not going to become visible until it's atomized properly in the air. And so there's a lot of very tricky things that happen when you're shooting at various targets. And splash is not the primary means of... uh, Uh, bullet observation as far as terms of where you're hitting i think that bullet trace is probably best but yeah that's a little bit of a bunny rabbit trail there but uh very good discussion indeed for those who haven't uh who are curious to what we're talking about check out the sniper 101 series me and lou sit down and talk about peripheral splash and all your different ways of spotting the shot and uh, it's a pretty good video out there but continue dimitri forgive me sir Oh, no problem. Oh, and I was going to say, too, on your on your cam shot, those guys that think that there's a guy in the grassy knoll, if they knew their time of flight, then they would know it's a real shot. Yeah, I that's pretty cute, I'd, yeah. I thought I'd put all that out there. I mean, they can figure it out if they have a ballistic calculator, and you, you can... You can. <laughs> it's, a, it's almost two seconds. That's a pretty long time, actually, for a, a supersonic bullet. We should do, like, a Mythbusters... Yeah, we. Oh, I do want to do MythBusters. So All the different movies out there, like American Sniper and the Sniper movie, and what's that Marky Mark Wahlberg video? They're all the same. Yeah, they're all kind of. They all blend together in this giant hodgepodge of awesomeness. Uh, but I, I definitely want to do a MythBusters series on the different movies where they have the gun scenes. Like, is that really what happens when the, when you do this? So I'm game. You game for this, Dimitri? You going to help us with this or what? Oh, yeah, I'm all for it. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just like you guys. so <laughs> Rock and roll, dude. But yeah, we're, we're looking at the ACSS reticle, and you're talking about you designed it actually with the, the drop holdover points to give you more forgiveness for not accidentally shooting too high. Is that correct? Correct. So that, that was a big factor in it. There's a lot of bullet drop compensators that have come out in the past, and attention to detail uh, wasn't made uh, there's a mathematical formula on the back end to make sure that the linear measurement laser etched on the glass is correct tgmoa times your focal length and that that's a big factor that i think a lot of companies miss is they send a reticle in the factory makes it and they have no idea how to check it on the back end so that's one thing that we took uh great steps to make sure everything was perfect when it came back. So you're talking about the laser etching process was skewing it just a tiny bit? Yeah, that and the focal length. There's a uh, if, if the math is wrong on the focal length, where it will say, let, let's say, I don't know, let's say 400 yards is your bullet drop comp, and the minutes of angle, you should be able to reverse that math. And let's say, you know, at 100 yards, minute is 1.0472, you should be able to multiply that by whatever the minutes are in the reticle, and in theory, set say two glows like two orange stick those sticky beechwood type targets apart, and your reticle should match up to those perfectly. Right on. Yep. And that's another thing with these reticles too. Is uh, I remember when we were visiting about it. Aside from getting the math right, after you design these, you would thoroughly vet them with a diversity of different styles of shooters. And uh, you want to maybe get into some of that, some of the folks who you've worked with to uh, design some of the other things. And if you look at this reticle, there's a lot more going on than just your uh, ballistic uh, drop compensation. You have some dots on the sides there. You want to explain what's going on there? Sure. Um, we found out through uh, a pretty large sniper study that the number one reason shots were missed was one was long range estimation and two was wind. So anybody that shoots further out, wind is a factor. So a lot of these reticles have a bullet drop compensator, but they don't show you any kind of, there's no reference for wind. So Mm -hmm. in a critical situation where you're having to return fire quickly, there's no time to look at your your dope sheet and figure out how many mils or how how much to hold for wind. And that's one thing that the reticle has in it. It's got built-in wind holds. So it makes it very easy to range and then hold for and what wind. are those dots spaced at, Dimitri? Are they 5 mile an hour wind value? Yeah, they're 5 miles an hour full value wind. And we chose 5 because it's the most common wind condition. Uh, a lot of our sets at 10. 
But I mean, you can run, you can look at the weather in pretty much any state, and it, it, it's not going to be at ten. It's going to be around five, six. Also, because it's constant, you can you can double the hold and hold for ten miles an hour, or you can cut it in half for two and a half. And yep. So, so on. it's very simple. Or angle corrections as well. If you're only shooting at half value, then you just cut her in half too. If the wind is quartering at you, so that's a very intuitive design there. Yep. Usually people think in in terms of five mile an hour increments in in terms of wind. It seems like yep. Mm-hmm. And uh, another thing we added was uh, there's a bracket off to the right. And uh, what that does is it ranges full height. The larger the object that you're milling or range estimating, the more precise your range. Yeah, larger base on your triangle in your trigonometry formula will give you a lot more pre- a lot more forgiveness in terms of getting your angle exactly correct. Exactly. Yep. So be- because of that, it gave us better range estimation. And again, that was the number one reason shot. So you bracket a full size guy inside that uh, bracket. Is that correct? Correct. Not only that, but you can range in different angles. Uh, targets don't often stand there and let you range them facing directly at you. They run, they take cover, all kinds of things right. happen. <laughs> we started all, we, you know, all the way back to the PSO-1 where it had a full, you know, the radical and the SVD, the looks like a ramp yep. kind of thing. So we, we went all the way back from that and looked at pretty much every radical that's ever come out. Borrowed attributes for some and had to create others to solve other issues on our own that other radicals just didn't That's your uh, mixed martial arts training coming out there, just kind of collecting anything that works and applying it to the, the problem. Exactly, yeah. So we also added uh, leads because that's another, if you, you know, talk to a sniper, you, you know, he's going to show you a data book of not only his uh, dope up and down and his wind, but there's also leads. And they, they tend to go off three leads. A full man sprinting is at nine. It's really at 8.6, but they shortcut it to nine, 6.1 and 3.1. So they teach it nine, six, and three. And uh, we put in the, on the reticle, two leads off, off to the left and right that your time of flight equates to a mover at a 90 degree angle. So a lot of the snipers we talk to, I uh, mentioned they're shooting at movers, crossing alleys. Uh, they're, you know, overwatching, and all of a sudden you got three or four guys running across the street. So now you're talking about a two, three-second uh, time for an engagement. I, again, there's no time to run data for that. And, uh, you know, they're having to shoot at movers like that. We, we I watched a documentary by uh, a guy named Ethan Place. Uh, um, he was a Marine in Fallujah. He got Silver Star. and uh, he was just really, really good at leading targets and um, having the proper mill hold. You know, we knew it was possible from watching him do it. So on some of the reticles, uh, if you notice, it only it stops at about 600. It doesn't go beyond that because mm-hmm. that's an unrealistic that's an unrealistic yeah, for shot. Yeah, for designated marksman mean, applications. Beyond 600, you really have to get more precise with your atmosphere and a lot of other variables and also – uh Things like lead, a moving target acquisition is going to be very, very difficult beyond 600. Almost, I mean, you can you can take shots if you need to, but it's not going to be something that's going to be encouraged. Yep. Yeah. So all the reticle design has, has come from a lot, a lot of research, studying engagements, studying competitions, and seeing what truly works and what truly doesn't. So, um, you know, and our, our bullet drop compensator, you know, you'll find those in optics that are at four power or one by six power, because they're you know they're designed for an AR-15. They're not designed for a precision bolt gun to use a bullet drop compensator on you know shooting. And like I said, about 800, 800 yards is really where you're. Once you go past that, you know your environmental elements are really yeah. Come into now play. you're in a whole different application. Yeah. Now you're in a, a precision long range fire application. So the designated marksman stuff is. Uh, not even really that much needed in those cases as well because the threat level to you or your guys is going to be different at 800 meters. It's not going to be an immediate threat to your life. So you, you're going to have more time to maybe dial in your scope more precisely. Correct. And, that, and like on the HUD DMR, we we uh, integrated the mill system in it still because the optic needs to be able to not only DMR but take a long-range precision shot with an exact firing solution. 
So you can still, mm-hmm. you know, run a Kestrel and dial in your turrets exactly mm-hmm. and use the Chevron tip. Yeah, so the reticle design is definitely very advantageous. And one of the neat things about uh, these primary arms optics, too, and one of the reasons, I got to be honest, man, is like I've become such a scope schnob over the years just because of my maybe my application of fire. I like that German glass, you know, and I like that uh, spending like your an entire month's salary or whatever on a scope. And it makes you feel warm and fuzzy on the inside when you look through it and all this. So I've kind of, my tastes have adjusted a little bit. So a lot of the stuff that's in the budget optics, you know, in that category is stuff that I never really followed a lot of. So when people started asking me a lot of the primary arms questions, I didn't even know what they're talking about. I didn't hear about it. So it took me a little bit to look it up. And then after I got some samples to play with, especially when you consider the application too, that's another thing that people fail to realize is uh, you can't cross over the, the scope selection criteria from extreme long range precision shooting over into this application of designated marksmanship rifle scopes because if you're using the reticle as your means of hold off for your wind your lead and your elevation and you don't have to mess with your turrets all of a sudden like 90 percent of your problems are solved in terms of having your scope being made in germany (laughs) (laughs) or or somewhere else maybe right this may be not as expensive because uh in my observation, you know, if, if you're going to have a scope where you're going to be turning the, the turrets and relying on those turrets to be 100% precise with your graduation precision accuracy and all that stuff and your repeatability of your turrets, you need to spend kind of a lot more time and effort on the materials and methods on construction and quality control mechanisms to make sure that when you dial it, it's going to be exactly right. But in a scope where you, the reticle does everything and where the reticle is laser etched on the glass, like you said said where it was checked that that laser etching was done properly with the proper focal length in mind and with all the variables accounted for everything's in the reticle and if it's a first focal plane reticle especially where that reticle is always pretty much good you don't ever need to mess with the turrets so now your demands for a three thousand dollar optic went down to three hundred dollar optic because all it needs to do is when you zero it it just needs to kind of stay there It's like a deer hunting scope in terms of the mechanical construction of the other components. So you don't need to spend thousands of dollars if you're doing a DMR application because it's all if if you have a reticle that can do all that for you. And that's the problem. Some of the other reticles don't cover all that ground. So maybe they do have more stringent demands on their turrets and some of the other features of the scope. But particularly these, you can... You can spend uh, $250, $300 on an optic and get something that's going to work incredibly well because you're not ever going to be dialing up and down and left and right with your turrets because it's all in the reticle. And that's something I hope that folks kind of understand when they're looking for optics is uh, I've had some uh, comments in some of my other videos where I reviewed some scopes with BDC style reticles in them. Uh, I think we re- reviewed a Nikon scope and uh, one gentleman uh, who is a... Another person who reviews optics was kind of uh, upset that we didn't do a box tracking test on the scope where you dial it up and see if it exactly goes the right amount of increments or whatever. But the thing is, that's irrelevant. If you've got a reticle that doesn't need you to dial up and down, then it's a completely irrelevant situation, in my opinion. So it can track exactly perfect or it can track not perfect. And actually, from uh, my experience playing with these is they track pretty decently i haven't done like uh, extensive box testing on them with hundreds of rounds under shock conditions i think other folks have uh, vetted them in that respect but uh in my opinion when you're talking scopes with reticle designs like this that's not even really an issue it's almost like it's like trying to see how much mud your ferrari can drive through it's like well i suppose you would know something but honestly that's not what that damn car is designed to do at all like and the, or like a mud bogging truck, you know, with forty four inch super swampers, and you're like, wow, what's the top speed? Well, it only goes sixty, so it's a pile of crap. Well, excuse me, it's a different application of uh, driving. You know what I mean? <laughs> so uh, when you're talking DMR scopes, you have a lot more forgiveness in terms of some of those turrets and things like that, and a lot of it just falls on a smart reticle design. Correct, and you you basically hit the nail on the head. I mean, there's been several. Uh Sniper instructors have been testing our budget optics, you know, not the high end stuff, the $270 optics like the R grid and the HUD. 
And uh, what we're hearing back is that you got a three thousand dollar reticle and a three hundred dollar <laughs> exactly. Scope. And 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 like you said, you know, it's a, you're not going to get a two hundred seventy nine dollar scope to track like a Schmidt and Bender or a Night Force like that. I mean, they're just I mean, you can track pretty close, but you're not. You know, it's not going to be. Uh, you start shooting past a thousand to the, the tenth of a mil increments like that. You're not going to be, you know, spot on. But because the reticles are laser etched. The laser is very, very precise. It's going to be, you know, as precise as any gear because the, letter, the reticle is laser etched. So when you hold two and a half mils on the grid or, or whatever your hold is, it's going to be And it's always exactly going to be where, consistent where because there's no moving because, parts on a reticle. <laughs> it's always going to stay there. <laughs> yeah, you start cranking on turrets, you know, after a few years, the springs start to loosen up, things happen. And because this has no moving parts, everything remains. So... What we're hearing is a lot of these uh, long-range instructors for their class, they'll, you know, grab a whole bunch of savages and put our grids on them. And now, you know, they got 10 rifles or whatever that they can reach out and actually be very effective with. So they're, you know, arming their students with budget stuff that is effective. Yeah, so just to run through some of your... uh... I just kind of want to hit on three of the reticle designs just so that people can understand the proper application of their usage. But when we're looking at the ACSS reticle, this is kind of your combat, like uh, panic reticle for standard designated marksman applications or even the infantry guy who wants to be able to push his rifle out to the max effective range of the cartridge. You don't need to know a whole lot. All you have to do is be able to put the guy in your bracket to know where to hold. And then you know where to hold because it's right on your reticle. And a very minimal amount of training will get you pretty good for combat applications with that reticle. So that's uh, a pretty good deal for that. When you're, we're looking at the R grid, and that's the next review I got coming out, uh, is the uh, 4 to 14 primary arms. Actually, uh, one of the optics that you guys got there is the R grid. And that's kind of that Horus style reticle. It's kind of a grid pattern, the tic-tac-toe thing going on. And... Um, I've always been skeptical of that too, just because I'm maybe I'm a traditional old school shooter. I don't like my reticle being crowded, but I have to admit that uh, if you want something for budget that gives you a precise aim hold off, it's kind of a hybrid between a normal long range precision reticle like a mill dot and one of these ACSS because you don't you still don't need to rely on the turrets, but you do have the ability to custom hold off your firing solution for any particular cartridge, uh, any atmospheric variation. So now you have opportunity to use your ballistic tables, but you can hold off in terms of pure angular measurements. So if you're at 600 meters or, or 1,200 meters or whatever, and your atmosphere changes a little bit, you can make that adjustment just in the reticle because it's all in pure forms of angular measurement. Uh, so that's a good hybrid in between. And I would think that would be kind of a... I don't want to say a poor man substitute for one of these high end scopes, but if you've got a reticle design like that, you don't need to mess with the turrets and it's a lot quicker actually. And it's very easy to get on target. If you can take two shots, you can fire one shot and miss and see exactly where it went and then make an instantaneous correction because wherever it hit in that grid pattern, you just hold there. And so it's a viable form of doing it for a slightly different application of fire. And for your extreme long range precision shooting, where you absolutely want to be dead on nuts accurate and you're going to dial everything in on the optic, then you have the Decamil reticle, which is actually pretty nice. I got it mounted up on a new custom rifle I'm about to review here soon. So anyone on the YouTube channel, stay tuned for a sneak peek on that whole setup. It's going to be a two and 3,000 meter rifle is the plan. So it's a pretty sweet ride. Yeah. <laughs> so you got lucky. Your scope got in uh, before a few other ones. I actually got a different scope on back order for about a year for that thing. But this one came in more quickly and it's actually looking like, like it might uh, do the task. But I've got one of the six to 30 uh, primary arms platinum series. And the platinum series is not one of it's, it's a totally different animal from uh the other ones a lot of the primary arm stuff primary arms i think kind of built its reputation from having some very affordable budget grade optics that were very smartly designed and uh but when you talk about the platinum series i was actually kind of surprised when i got it out of the box it's uh it's actually it looks like it's all made in japan 
and it's uh, very comparable to some of the other stuff that's made in Japan that I've played with that is in the multi-thousand dollar bracket. So it's a really good value, and I haven't got a chance to thoroughly battle test it yet, but just in terms of mechanical precision, uh, how the scope feels, I did get a few rounds to it. The tracking was dead on accurate, and just the overall quality of it, uh, it's looking like it's going to be kind of promising. So I'm, I'm excited to be able to get some rounds for this thing. But if you want to kind of go over maybe some of the, the different things with the Platinum series, what do you guys got going on there? Uh, we have two optics there. One is the DECA, which is set for, like you mentioned, extreme long-range type shooting. Uh, we also have the HUD DMR reticle in uh, the Platinum series as well. So that's more designed for a, a Precision 308. The HUD DMR is specifically set for a 308. Um, okay. uh, the Deca mill? No, okay. the the Grendel lines up to it. Some two two three loads line up. Uh, unlike other companies, we actually show the minute of angle on each increment. And if you there's also ballistic software, you know people can access and input their load in, and it'll show you the exact hold on on the reticle. But the HUD DMR is really set for uh, like I, I'd want to mount it. I have it mounted on a on a three hundred eight uh, AR. That's set for uh, DMR slash long range because the the HUD DMR reticle is set for DMR, but because it has the mill system in it and you can actually dial in the turrets and, and because it tracks so true, you can cross into long range with it as well. But uh, I, I recommend that scope, that reticle for like, a, like an AR, any kind of AR-10, 308, uh, any kind of to write bolt gun, that kind of thing. Uh, the DECA, you know, we recommend that for 308 and above. So uh, 338 Lapua Magnums, you know, uh, stuff that you'd really reach out with is really the, the DECA now, reticle. With the Platinum Series, at. I'm sorry to interrupt there. With the Platinum sc- Series scopes, a lot of folks might be kind of confused by the price range because it's a 30, is that a 34 millimeter? Uh, yeah. So you got a 56 millimeter objective lens, six to 30, and it's got the zero stop feature and it's got all the big turrets. So you got a lot of scope there. And when I picked it up, it actually was very weighty. And from when I I did a little uh, digging around, maybe behind your back a little bit on your company there, talking to some different folks. Uh, But uh, I caught word that that's actually, they used matched glass in that stuff, which is very desirable. And uh, I kind of get the impression that this might be uh, same quality as some of these other optics coming from the same general part of the world that are priced a lot more steeply. And uh, so how do you guys... I got to know, like, so the $1,500 price range, a lot of people are going to think they're going to get a $1,500 scope and they're going to want to maybe spend $2,000 on a different scope besides the primary arms because, you know, the reputation of primary arms has been budget scopes in the past. But this is kind of a different animal. And what's the situation with you guys' price situation there? How do you do that? Well, here's how that works is a lot of companies, they'll say it's made in Japan, but you'll find out that only a few parts are made in Japan, and it's actually made in the Philippines or other countries. These optics are made 100% in Japan. And, uh, yeah, if if you were to purchase the same quality and same feature, same spec optic, you would end up paying probably about double in price to get to the same optic. The way we get the price so low is one is <laughs> our CEO is actually a, a, a great guy, and he honestly almost feels bad overcharging for these things, as crazy as that sounds. But uh, not only that, but we we fly over and meet with the factory owners, and there's no sales reps in between because the more people in between, the more middlemen, the more they start you know, taking their cut and and the price goes up. So we eliminate a lot of that and we get right to the source. And uh, because of that, these you streamline the process. You get a great a price on it. Yeah, because it seems like I mean, I've seen a lot of competing scopes that are in this quality range that are maybe at least $2,000, maybe $2,300, $2,500 for some of them. And so I was just curious on uh, how, how you guys pull that off or if there's some kind of hidden deal that I didn't know about or what the heck's going on. 
Because <laughs> I, I mean, I got it, and I was, I was uh, in that skeptical category. I'm not going to lie, and I was excited to be able to try new scopes that I haven't seen because I'm curious. But I was thinking, well, I'm going to have to review this and then maybe find someone else who can use it, you know? Because I'm such a schnob with my scopes. But I opened up the box of that, and I, when I do the full review, I think I can give you my my first impressions of it. But it actually. I mean, it's very nicely put together. And when I did uh, uh, just like simple things, like okay, when you take the turrets off to get at the uh, zero stop mechanism and you get kind of a look at how nicely it's machined, you got very good refinement there. Like those Japanese guys, I'll tell you what, they got some good attention to detail. Their culture really paid off in terms of manufacturing. They, I, I do respect their manufacturing abilities. So it's a very nicely refined scope. And I'm excited to get some more rounds out of it. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's made in the best factory in Japan. I mean, that we, we just try to give you more value for your dollar, and uh, that's kind of always been our formula, you know? We're kind of like the Well, that could be Honda catchy. Be careful optics, what you say. Uh, in any price level, we're <laughs> getting to the, <laughs> Yeah, right? My, my Honda broke just last week, or my uh, my wife's pilot. We have a family <laughs> car. Honda. No, I like Breaking Honda. Down. I like yeah, Honda a lot. Yeah, that. they they they're a very reliable car. Yeah, and the price is right. So, but no, that's uh, yeah, that's something to consider when you're talking about that. It's pretty cool. Did you have a question, Casey? I do. It's kind of off topic ish, but of out of all of these scopes that you've designed, what is your favorite scope that you've designed, and why? Uh, probably the TA thirty one. By Trigicon, the uh, you know standard A cognizant service, and uh, not because so much of its capability. I mean, it's combat proven and so on. But when we when we take it through our test ranges, we find out even our one by six budget optic is just as accurate as it because they they both use the same reticle. They go through the same reticle. Yeah, we neglected to, to mention that earlier, but you also correct. had. The patents and you designed the reticle in the TA31 Trigicon, which is a very well respected optic in military circles for sure. Yep. Mm -hmm. so, and it's mainly because that was a goal of mine, you know, is to get my reticle in that optic. So when it finally happened, it it's kind of, you know, you, you take the reticle capability, kind of my life goal to get my reticle in it and its combat proven capability, it's kind of made it my, my favorite optic. So that's. That's probably my favorite optic. I'm also a big fan of our. Uh, we 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 make a micro dot that has the ACSS reticle in it. It's like a, a reflex sight, and uh, that's become one of my favorites too, just because it's so lightweight or so durable. And um, okay, they're back in stock, so I gotta like save. So I got a question for you here. So you had an opportunity to uh, run a lot of these uh, reticle designs by serious military operator guys, and what's been their experience with them? Have they uh, has it improved their time on target performance, or what have you found out there? Yeah, the the DMR one has been really uh, almost you know exactly what they've been looking for in the DMR type role. Mainly Marine Corps. I, I grew up with a few friends that saw a lot of action. And um, anybody and everybody that uh, I came in contact with that knew anything, I picked their brains. I'm, I'm a student of the art. What you said with your uh, intro when you're talking about the mixed martial arts philosophy is uh, collecting a diversity of observations from multiple people in the field. And I know that even when we're looking at, uh, you sent me some of the examples of some of the other new ones you have in the works, like you got some varmint hunting reticles coming out for coyote shooting and stuff. And uh, just from, I, I know personally that from the way you try to collect data from various different kinds of shooters, old cowboys and dedicated varmint hunters, and for whatever application you're looking into, that's a very good way to do it. And it's just being eclectic pays off a lot of times because uh, you don't want to miss any of the details and you can learn from a lot of people's collective experience. I think a lot of people who design stuff in the field, and it's interesting when you, I, I look at some of the huge brand name manufacturers back 10 years ago, before the long-range shooting craft really kind of got its fire lit in the United States, I would call some of these companies like Leupold and some of these other outfits looking for an optic that was configured in a way that we needed. And us long-range shooting guys knew what we needed. 
and they would argue with us on what we wanted. And I'm like, no, you're not listening, dude. Like, I need first focal plane. I need mill mill configuration turrets. And they're like, well, no one uses that in the United States. I'm like, well, why? Um, I, <laughs> no one that you may, maybe talked to yet. So I ran into a lot of resistance. And there's been a few different outfits that have been very innovative uh, over the years. And uh, those ones seem like they're ahead of the curve on some of those things. And it's... Uh, I always appreciate it when you see real talent at work when you're talking about design and anything as they're listening. And a truly wise man will always listen to what other people have to say and not necessarily believe it right away, but just collecting, continuously learning because the second we decide that we know everything is the second we cease to learn at that point. Once you know everything, how can you learn anything new, right? (laughs) <laughs> so no that's one of the things i really do uh like about you man and after visiting with you too is you're always uh, continuously gathering new uh observational data to to get these things right on and, and the products that have come out thus far are actually very very state-of-the-art and i i really think they're well designed i, I was gonna say i want to thank you for that on the varmint radical because you know you you were right about the extending the range on it and you know some of the some of the stuff like making the line thinner. Sure, yeah, like yeah. The there's a lot thinner. of different things so, that come into play with, and there's know, a lot of different opinions too. But it, I think that it's good to to gather a uh, uh, a diversity of your opinions and kind of maybe balance it out and see what the general trend of what uh, what is needed out there. And that's that's cool to be in on the inner circle on some of them deals. But yeah, it, it's come out in really good reticle designs. What's a goal personally for you to work towards as far as going forward in the company or? Just personally, like, what's your next goal? Uh, my next goal is to invent things that don't involve themselves around firearms and shooting. As crazy as that might sound, um, <laughs> I, w- <laughs> I would like to design some stuff that I don't know. I would love to be able to save kids or something, you know, something like that. Yeah, I, and I understand it's a it's a tool, and you can use it for good or bad, but. Um, I think I've made up my mind at some point to uh, design other things, I guess. As far as like stuff that could be used for kids or just just beginners in general, what is a scope that you guys have that is suited for somebody that doesn't know anything, you know, about long range, about scopes, about anything like that? What's the most basic, easy to use scope that you guys offer? I would say probably just the standard ACSS stuff, like the one by six or the uh, our five power, or, you know, three and a half. So if it's for a kid that's kind of getting into shooting, I highly, highly recommend. And this is one of my favorite optics: is our uh, six power calibrated 422 long rifle. That's uh, yeah. I have one of my participants in the project actually game. through a kind of pest control. He's heard tool. through a peripheral discussion. Uh, he maybe overheard us talking about the primary arms behind the scenes, and he went out and bought a few of them because <laughs> he wanted to try them out. But he's got one the twenty two plankers, and he's stoked about that thing. That's that was straight four power, six power. What is that one? It's a six power. Yeah, the way we ended up with that is uh, I initially designed the ACSS for the uh, TA thirty one. I mean, it was designed for Trigicon. And I went to a shot show a couple times and couldn't get through. I mean, the people I was talking to literally <laughs> didn't know what I was talking That's about. That's why you call me all the time. Speaking to them, you know. <laughs> so, but yeah, the the first optic that it ended up in was the six power. So our first ACSS uh, base reticle was in that six power, and it, and it proved itself and you know used on a five five six and three oh eight for quite some time. We had very a very low failure rate on that optic. So when they talked about discontinuing it, you know, getting rid of it, I, I was just heartbroken. I'm like, no, this, you know, I, I like to keep stuff that works. If it works, let's keep it. There's no reason to try something new that's not proven. I mean, you could try it, but you don't want to disregard what helped but has proven itself. So I thought, well, let's keep it and let's let's do a 22 reticle on it. Although it's made for a 22, I mean, the thing will handle like a 308. So it's beefy little optic for 100, and I don't know what's it retail for. It's 100 and 20 bucks or yeah, something like that. Yeah. And you get pretty clean glass, you know, and it's because the reticle is laser etched, it's solid. Once you dial it in, you're, you're good to go. 
Well, it's just no wonder after all this time that a guy like Dimitri would actually hook up with a guy like you, Rex, because you guys have got a lot in common when it comes to your scientific minds, to your problem-solving abilities, and just the way you tackle your hobbies and you make your hobbies part of your life and you try to make the world a better place with it. It's pretty awesome stuff. And for the first guest ever on the Rex Reviews podcast, Mr. Dimitri, you killed it, sir. Thank you for being a part of the program. Bye. 